So Paul has, uh, <clears throat> has answered their concerns about the rapture, and we ended chapter 4 with his statement, therefore comfort one another in this truth. And we spoke about the fact that the only way that that can be comforting, all that he has taught them about the rapture, is that if the rapture comes before the wrath of God, or comes before uh, the day of uh, the Lord. But it's clear that Paul feels it necessary to continue on to answer uh, the concerns that they have about the day of the Lord, which they know to be God's judgment. And we, again, talked about that. There are different ways to view the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's, it's human events uh, in the near term. Sometimes it's events um, of, um, of coming judgment and destruction that God brings on the nation of Israel in the, in the near future. And then sometimes it speaks of this final time of cataclysmic judgment of the entire world that God will bring uh, when his son returns. But in the New Testament, all of the references to the day of the Lord refer to those last days, those last times. And we think that encompasses the last seven years of man's history uh, called in the Old Testament and the New Testament the time of tribulation uh, leading up to uh, the final um, event which is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and during that time there will be massive judgments from God poured out against this earth and against sinners at the same time Satan's emissary the Antichrist will be wreaking havoc on the world it will be a horrific place to be and it will be uh, a place of mass destruction and unbelievable loss of life. If you add up the numbers in the book of Revelation, you are well over half of the population of the world that will die in these uh, seven-year uh, times of agony and wrath. <clears throat> and so they are rightly concerned that there be no misunderstanding that they, in fact, are not destined for uh, God's wrath or they are not going to be part of this day of the Lord that has been prophesied and which Paul has talked to them about. And so in chapter 5, <clears throat> Paul now comforts them by explaining to them that they are not going to experience uh, the wrath of God. They will not be uh, in this time called the, the day of the Lord. And with that, let's just read, uh, beginning in chapter 5 and verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So, so he says, the day of the Lord is coming, and it is going to come in an unanticipated way. Those that are going to be here are going to be surprised. It is going to be um, unexpected, and it is going to be shocking to them, and it is going to be exceedingly detrimental. It will be just like a thief who comes to your house for no good purpose but to do evil. So too, this not to do evil, but God will bring this judgment against the evil in the same like manner as a surprise, an unanticipated event to them. But I don't need to write you about this, Paul says, because we've already talked about the fact the Lord has told us that we can't know the exact time. We cannot know the day or the hour, or in this case, we do not need and cannot know uh, the, the, uh, perfectly wh when that is going to come because it is in uh, the mind of God alone. But we do know that there will be signs, there will be ways to tell the, the event is coming, the, it will be led up by a number of particular events, many of which we talked about last time, we won't go into them again, but it is a, a time where there will be a false peace and a false sense of security and safety, probably brought in by the Antichrist as we enter into that final seven-year period. And then sudden destruction will come upon them, just as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. The destruction will begin. It, it, it will be painful. That pain will increase in intensity, and the distance between those pains will grow shorter and shorter until the culminating events of God's judgment and the Lord's return. But here's the comforting part. 
It begins in uh, verse uh, 4. And he says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. He's saying, you are not going to experience this wrath. And then he turns to a series of metaphors to separate those of us who are with Christ, in Christ, from those of us who are not. Separate those of us who are not going to experience the wrath of God from those who will experience the wrath of God. And, and the metaphors are uh, fairly straightforward and simple, and they begin here in uh, verse 5. Actually, there's a reference to them in verse uh, 4, but it's verse 5 that we talked about uh, last time. It says, You are sons of light and, the sun, and sons of the day, but we are not of the night nor of the darkness. Verse 4 said, But you, brethren, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So, so the metaphor that he begins with is the metaphor of light and darkness, light and darkness. And that's a, a metaphor that's throughout the scripture. And once again, we talked about it in detail last time. But you remember, from a spiritual standpoint, or, or, or a metaphysical standpoint, meta, metaphysical, metaphorical standpoint, um, <laughs> light sp- speaks of understanding, knowledge, wisdom, and holiness. It is that which is granted to us from the author of wisdom and knowledge and the one who is light, that is, God himself. Apart from that, all human beings are in a state of spiritual darkness. That is, they are, in the words of God, they are fools, they are foolish, and they are sinful. And I think uh, that probably doesn't need a lot of uh, support. I think pretty much we can look around uh, anywhere in this world and find uh, examples um, of that. It is, um, it, it is, it is mind-blowing sometimes th- the things that people think are important in this world, the, the places that they spend their time, the, the, the way they talk about life and death, and then the way they live life as if there is no death, as if there is no judgment. It is, um, it is a darkness that is theirs, and it is who they are. The, the scripture says they are dark because their minds are ruined by their sin, and their hearts are controlled by it because of the fall. So they live their lives without any answers to the questions in life, and they live their lives in abject rebellion against God. People say, isn't that unfair? Isn't that isn't that unfair of God to leave them in that state? But the scripture is clear that every human being not only lives in darkness under the power of darkness, which is that which Satan controls, this world and his minions, but they are in that state because they love to be in that state. Man loves his darkness. So when when the Bible talks about light, then it draws us immediately to the source of light, which is God himself. And the scripture says that God is in fact light and he dwells in unapproachable light and then when we think of the Lord Jesus he comes into the world as what the the light of the world and and he he breaks into this place of darkness and he calls to himself men and women into the kingdom of of light from the kingdom of darkness. And he not only calls us into the kingdom of light, but he changes us, he transforms us from literally being darkness to being light. And then, and then he calls us to, to, to walk in the light, that is to walk, live based on who we are, these transformed people who now understand what God says and desires to 
be like God. That is, we desire to reflect his light in our desire to be obedient in our love for him. And we understand why we're here, and we understand the purpose of our life, and we understand where we are going. And we need to shine that light, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, from lives that reflect the transforming power of that gospel that changed us from darkness to light. And we talked about the very profound um, the very profound contrast between light and darkness when you look at eternity. Because people in the darkness, of the darkness, are headed for eternal darkness because that's the way scripture defines hell, at least that is one of the descriptions of it. Eternal darkness. And yet we, we who have come to Jesus, we who have been called out of the darkness into his light, we are headed for eternal life. And we are, excuse me, eternal light because we have eternal life. So we're going to heaven. And in heaven, there is no darkness because the Lord is the light and we will be with him forever. So this metaphor that he uses of light and darkness is a powerful one and worthy of your continued study and meditation on it because it is such a profound uh, and, and really amazing uh, truth. In fact, he says in verse 5 then, you are all sons of light. Sons of light. That is, you have been transformed so that you are a child of God and God has made you into a son of light. That means the thing that dominates you now is light. Mm -hmm. The thing that dominates you is the, the reality of your love for Jesus Christ as it's manifested in your obedience to him because you have a new nature. And that nature is one that has been opened to and transformed into light. We are sons of light, and he says we are therefore sons of the day. And this is the other metaphor he's going to use and mix into these verses. There's light and darkness, and then there's day, and there is night. And we are sons of the day, not of the night or of the darkness. When you, uh, when you have been transformed, when you have undergone this radical change from darkness to light, from night to day, you, you are called then to live in response to that. Because even though we have been transformed, we are new in our nature, we possess the Spirit of God, we still exist as human beings. We still exist in our humanness. And in our humanness, we are still subject uh, to sin. We are still subject to temptation. So Paul, after describing who they are in their essence, in their standing before God, now moves to encourage them to live that way. He says, therefore, in verse 6, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So here's another metaphor. Yeah, the, the metaphor is those that are awake and sober and those that are asleep and dark. People of the day, people of the light, and people who are alert. People of the night, people of the what did I say? Day the right? Darkness and people who are asleep. And all three of those things just speak of the same groups of people. As we said when we talked last time, there are only two groups of people in the world. They are the people of the day or the people of the night, the people of the light or the people of the darkness, the people that sleep or the people that are awake spiritually. So, he says, for those who sleep sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Now he mixes in the spiritual truth with the physical reality. It is, um, it is interesting that w if, when you look at the activities of people who, who Scripture called 
darkness or in the night, they live lives that are sinful. And much of their sinful lives takes place in the night. They are more comfortable in the night. I can, uh, from my own experience, I had a close personal friend that I went to college with, and, and he, was a, uh, he was a man who just constantly rejected the gospel. And, and a man of great uh, success, great physical wealth, um, a g great personality, many friends, handsome man, but just lost. And, and one of the interesting manifestations of that is he lived in the night. I mean, he, he just loved stay, staying up until early morning hours and sleeping through the day. And I thought, what an interesting example uh, metaphorically of what's being spoken of here. Because people generally do their worst in the night <laughs> where they can't uh, be seen. But it is, again, it is, still, it is still the spiritual reality that we're looking at here. So when we're talking about people in the darkness, <clears throat> you say, therefore, let us not sleep, in verse 6, 6, as others, but let us watch and be sober for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, uh, get drunk in the day. So, so the, the, the idea of sleeping here is it, we are not to be unaware we are not to be spiritually unaware. We are to be discerning. We are to understand the spiritual implications of what's going on in the world, the spiritual implications of what's going on in our church, the spiritual implication of what's going on in God's plan, and the spiritual implications of what's going on in your life, in and around you. You are to see life based on the way God sees it. You have been given the right and the privilege by the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the discernment that you have to be able to rightly view the circumstances of life. And sometimes that's difficult because we don't always do that. We find ourselves falling back into viewing world, the world as the world views the world or as we used to view, view the world. And we are not to do that. We are to be discerning because we are not to be asleep. So when we look at the things that are going on in the world as an example, we do not get discouraged and down because things are getting worse. Now there's a there's a part of us that that looks to the good old days, uh, assuming they were good, they were old. Uh, but but the but the view of Christians is that that this place is going where God is taking it. And we are we are his children, and we are not asleep. We understand that it is headed in that direction, and we simply desire to follow him, honor him, and use whatever circumstances we live through to give him glory and share the gospel. Because we know that we're headed for heaven. It, it, is, it is so easy to think that if you lose an election or the wrong person gets in, that somehow everything is going to be messed up. Listen, if everything's going to be messed up, it's just what God has said. <laughs> right? The issue for us is to continue to explain to people that God is in control and you need to get right with him because it isn't going to last. This, somebody said it once, you know, this is a throwaway planet. God is going to burn it. So don't get all caught up in trying to keep it. <laughs> keep your eyes focused on heaven and on his plan and on his purpose. And that's what you're privileged to be able to do because you're children of the light, because you're children who aren't asleep but awake. And the world, on the other hand, they, they are asleep. They have no clue. Everything to the world is just random occurrences, random chances. Everything is just um, a, a matter of quote unquote good or bad luck. There, there are no answers for people that are in the darkness. That's the definition of being in the darkness. And they are sound asleep. And what does that mean? It means they have no idea that judgment's coming. 
They have no idea that judgment's coming. Now, somewhere in them, they may sense they've got a problem. I really believe people do. But they live their lives as if there's no consequence to what they're doing, as if there will never be a judgment day, as if there is no God. They are sound asleep on a speeding train headed for the abyss, and they're having a party in their sleep. Right. So, their only hope is for you to shine some light. Tell them the only answer. And pray that God would wake them from their slumber and transform them as these transformed us. Lou, I but, find it interesting that the word asleep is usually meaning death in Scripture. And the more you talk about it, the more I realize, yeah, it still does. They're, they're dead intellectually. They're dead. Their wisdom is dead. Their choices are dead. Yeah, and, and there is an interesting, though, because there are two different Greek words. One was used okay. back in chapter 4, and one's used yeah. here in chapter 5. And they do, it, they do provide the key to understanding a, a particular verse we're going to get to. Because so, it says, look, he says, in verse 6, he says, therefore, let us not sleep. Now, the implication here is that you can. You can, you can still, you can be uh, uninvolved, uninformed, unconcerned. You can be a, a, a Christian that is just not concerned about being discerning. You can, you can kind of sleepwalk through this even though you know the Lord. Because he keeps exhorting us to, to not sleep as the others do, but watch and be sober. Don't be intoxicated by the things of this world. Do not allow yourself to be pulled away in your understanding by the, the events or the attractions or the things of this world. Be discerning with the discernment that God has given you. He says, verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober and be ready. Be alert. And he says, be alert as if you are a soldier. He says, let us, verse 8, put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. This, it's a warfare. It's a spiritual warfare. And the, and the attacks will come against you by the darkness and by the power of the forces of the darkness. But God says, be aware so that you can stand. It's the same kind of language that you'd find in Ephesians chapter 6 when we are called to put on our spiritual armor. Here, he does the same thing. He adjusts the armor a little bit, but you'll understand it. It is still God's provision for our protection if we are alert and we are ready to stand against the darkness and be discerning as to what God is doing. The essence of it is, though, what darkness is going to come at you with is an effort to lie to you, right? If, look, if light is wisdom and understanding, then darkness are lies and foolishness. Right. If, if light is holiness and righteousness, then darkness is sin and debauchery. And so, the darkness is going to try to pull you back to itself by lying to you, trying to get you to believe things that are not true about God and about his word, and elicit you to disobedience or sin. And so, God provides your resources. And Paul says, but let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So there's a breastplate, and the breastplate covers your vital areas. 
and, and the breastplate is spiritual. And what it, it has two aspects to it. This breastplate has two aspects to it that make you impenetrable in the attacks that come against you to solicit you to sin. The temptations that come or the lies that come against you. But particularly those temptations, those things that try to uh, seduce you. And the first is faith. First part of your armor is faith. And why? Because all sin is failure to trust God. All sin is failure to trust God. So Paul says, look, the breastplate is faith. That is trusting God. Trusting God. And, and how do you do that? Well, you trust God because you remember, you meditate on, you rely on who he is. His character. His attributes. His plan. His promises. When you are tempted to disobey God, to follow after a lie, you have to remember what God says. His promises are true because his character is faithful and his power is adequate to move you through whatever that temptation is soliciting you to. God is an adequate resource and you possess him because you possess his spirit and he simply calls you to believe and trust in him by believing what he says in his word and remembering who he is. Remember he loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He would not lead you in the wrong direction. He would not take you to a place that is harmful for you spiritually. He will do what is best for you but you must trust him. And he is trustworthy. Nothing can hinder his plans. Nothing can stop his promises. Because he is the almighty, all-knowing, ever-present, holy, faithful, just God. So before you succumb, remember. And trust. Not a blind trust. A trust based on your understanding of him. And then there's the, the other part of the breastplate, which is love. Well, how does, it, how does love protect you? Well, if you're devoted to him, then sin doesn't have that attraction. If you're, if you're committed to honor him, then you want to do nothing to harm him or dishonor him. And so when, when you are solicited away from him, you just remember your love for him based on who he is and what he's done for you. And you, you remember that you, your love is not only for him, but your love is for others. So, so if, if you are committed to the best for others, if you are sacrificially and selfly, care, selflessly caring about other people, then you will not be led astray by the solicitations to do evil. You, how can you do evil toward people if you're committed to love them? And how can you do evil to people if you're committed to love the Lord? So the breastplate is an anchor. It's a protection against temptation, but only if you remember who he is, if you remember his promises, if you understand his power, and if you love him and love others. And then, there's not only the breastplate, but Paul gives us another, another item of armor. He says it's the helmet of the hope of salvation. Go with me to Romans for a minute, Romans uh, chapter 8. This is an interesting uh, concept. This, um, it, we've talked about salvation before as being having three uh, aspects to it. Uh, that is uh, justification, sanctification, and glorification. That is the, the past event that has happened uh, in your life when you came to Jesus Christ and were justified. The process you're now in of being 
changed and molded into the very image of Christ being sanctified and the ultimate end of your salvation, that is your glory in heaven, right? And it is the third part of this salvation that's in view here as Paul looks at the armor. Not so much your justification and your sanctification, but it is your anticipation of God's promised glory. Look at, look at Romans uh, chapter uh, 13 and verse 11. And doing this, excuse me, and do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. See, don't sleep like you used to. Don't sleep like you were asleep. Awake. Be sober-minded. Why? Because your salvation is nearer. What salvation? You're already saved, right? The, the issue is you're the culmination of your salvation, that is your glory. The end is near. The Lord is coming back. We're going to go to heaven. Glory is the result, the end result of our salvation. And he says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Don't walk in the darkness. You're not of the darkness. Don't act like somebody you're not. You used to be that way. Don't do that. Be alert. Be aware. And walk with him in righteousness and holiness in anticipation of glory, which is coming. So, in, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 30, He says, moreover, whom he is predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And there it is. Glorified is in the past tense. That means if you've been justified, you're going to be sanctified. If you're sanctified, you're going to be glorified. There is no partial salvation. You get it all. If you have come to Christ, you will go to glory. But you can still live apart from the blessedness that God desires you to experience. And you need to put on the armor just as he has called us to. What happens if you uh, fail uh, to do that? Well, he said... Um, he says in verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are what, awake or asleep, we should live together with him. In, in other words, if you have come to Jesus Christ, you are saved. He calls you to be awake and alert for the blessedness of it. So you cannot be taken into that place where God cannot bless you. You cannot be taken into sin and into lies. But if you fail to do that, if you still slumber, you are not lost if you're really saved. And that's what he says. And that's the, that's the word that Bob was talking about. When it, we talk about sleep here, it is that word for spiritual sleep. It is not the word for, for the sleep of death, which we saw back in, in uh, chapter 4. So it's an exhortation to believers to live to who they are. And they are not like they used to be. And they are not, therefore, subject to wrath, even though they may not choose to follow as closely as God would want them to and receive the blessedness and the understanding that God wants them to have. They are still secure, and they are still safe. And that's what Romans 8.1 says. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you want to be spiritually lethargetic, that is your choice. It will result in less than blessedness, and it will result in trouble for you in this world that you do not need to go through. But it will not threaten your salvation. So... Paul says, comfort one another with these words. Remind one another. That's what we're doing today, right? We're comforting one another. We are not going through the day of the Lord. We are not going through the wrath of God because we are sons of light. Now, it does raise some issues that we must talk about. <laughs> 
Look, <coughs> if you are of the day, but you are not alert, you are not prepared, if you allow your faith to grow weak, your love to grow cold, and your hope, th then the result of that is the hope of your salvation will dissipate. And what is that? That is the assurance of your salvation. The security of your salvation is an absolute truth. That's a done deal. That is a transaction completed. That is something that God has done. You are saved. But your sense of that salvation, your sense of your right being with God, is dependent on your following after Him, allowing the Spirit of God to control your life. And if you choose to not grow in the grace and knowledge of God, if you choose not to grow in your faith and your love for Him, and they begin to wane, then you will begin to question whether you are actually saved or not. And God wants you to know, if you're real, you're safe but it's not the best place to be. It's not the place that gives Him glory, and it's not a place where you're going to experience the blessedness that He wants you to have. That's issue number one. Issue number two, if you ma manifest none of these virtues, by the way, we've just talked about the three, what we would call the three primary Christian virtues, right, in this armor, faith, hope, and love, right? That, that marks us as who we are. If you do not have faith, it's not real. If you do not love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you really don't have hope, then you need to be sure that you're a child of light. You need to be sure that you're not deceived. You, you need to... Test yourself, as 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, to see if you're really in the faith. Don't make a mistake. It's one thing to temporarily fall into lethargy. It's another to never have really known him and loved him and trusted him. And if you're in that position, then you are in extreme danger of finding yourself in the wrath of God and in eternal darkness. Be sure you are really born again. Be sure you really love him and you really uh, trust him. The issue is judgment or blessedness. It's hell or it's heaven. And hell is just as real as heaven is. Don't make a mistake. But if you've come, rest in the assurance that we will not experience the day of the Lord. We will not experience the wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time and your word. Thank you for this amazing little epistle. Thank you for all the truth that you've given to Paul to give to us by the power of your spirit. Comfort us in the reality that we belong to you, Lord. We pray that your spirit would assure us that we are truly yours. Pray that there's no hypocrisy in us, Lord. There's no misunderstanding about what it is to come to you and give our lives to you. And then I pray that we would just live in that reality, Lord, and grow in the grace and knowledge of you. Allow you to sanctify us, transform us, and change us. Always, always looking uh, for the blessed hope that is you, Lord, and that is our place in heaven. And until then, help us to be and live as children of the light, in the daylight, Lord, putting on the armor, trusting you, and knowing that our hope is secure in you. Thank you, Jesus, for making all of this and so much more possible. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.